Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar of the Graduate School of Communication. Um, we are here today to talk about the program and how you can apply uh, for it. Um, I'm really glad that you have found the time to join us and we hope that we can answer all your questions today uh, during this session. Next to me, wait, first of all, let me introduce myself. My <laughs> name is Nunang Trang and I'm the admission officer from the Graduate School of Communication. Next to me sits uh, Stephanie Welton. She's a professor uh, at our uh, uh, program and uh, she will discuss or talk to you about the uh, content of the program later on. Um, but first, uh, let me um, tell you more about how the webinar works. Uh, as you all know, it is an interactive webinar, so there will be an opportunity for you to ask uh, several questions during the presentation, and we will try to answer them. But I have some help from two colleagues. They are sitting behind the chat, and they will uh, answer your question via the chat. Also, at the end of every topic, there will be an opportunity to uh, ask your questions. Um, probably they are going to sign us in if there is a question that is relevant for all you guys. And we will try to uh, yeah, talk about it during the presentation so you will um, be notified about it. Okay, let's see. What is this presentation about? Well, as I said before, we are going to talk something about the content of the program. Stephanie will do this. And afterwards, in the second part of the presentation, we will uh, give you more information, more practical information about uh, the how to apply, what the admission requirements are, and uh, what to do afterwards. Um, but first, let's start. So, Stephanie, will you? Tell us something more about the program. Yes, so hello everyone. Like Nung already said, my name is Stephanie Welten and I'm an assistant professor at the Master Communication Science. So today I'm going to talk you uh, uh, going to talk to you a bit more about the program we have. But before I do that, I would like to zoom in a bit more on what communication science exactly is. So Communication science is an academic discipline within the social and behavioral sciences. And that means that it studies, um, that it uses empirical and theoretical studies to investigate uh, the, the creation, the content, the meaning, and the consequences of media and communication. And it does so not only within individuals, but also in organizations and in society. So what does it exactly mean to study communication science at the University of Amsterdam? Well, we have three programs. Uh, we have a one-year program, a two-year research program, and we have an Erasmus Mundus program. So I will zoom in more on all the programs, but let me now uh, take you quickly through them. So the one-year program consists of four tracks. And the first track is called uh, corporate communication. So you might want to study, uh, uh, you might want to choose this track if you're interested in how you can manage, for instance, corporate scandals, such as um, Apple's iPhone 6 that seem to bend in people's back pockets. So that is corporate communication. But you might also be more interested in, uh, for instance, the Ice Bucket Challenge then, that went viral on social media uh, um, a, a year ago, uh, uh, something like that. And um, uh, you might want to investigate why it went viral, but also how you can actually make a persuasive campaign such that people donate to the um, uh, ALSA uh, Foundation. Um, you might also be more interested in political communication. So, for instance, how do politicians use the social media in order to attract more votes? Also a very interesting topic. Another, uh, our last one year master program track is called entertainment communication. And questions that are studied here are, for instance, how do uh, youngsters use games in order to entertain themselves? And what does it mean to have a gaming addiction and how can we prevent that? Um, so what's important to stress, I think, is that this is, these, are all, uh, these are all separate tracks, but these tracks eventually lead you to get the same degree, and that is the Master Degree in Communication Science. So what does that mean? It means that you, um, 
that you should choose a, a track that really appeals to you. So something that really gets you going, something that really interests you, because in the end, you will all get the same degree no matter what track you choose. So choose something that you really like. Um, you might also be an a student that likes to be extra challenged. So you like research a lot, you want to get to the bottom of theories, you want to elaborate more on uh, studies that you read about and uh, you like the extra challenge. Well then maybe the two-year program is something for you. This is a research master program in which you uh, focus mostly on conducting your own research and you uh, obtain lots of research skills. Then our final program is the Erasmus Mundus program. This program is a special program. It, uh, it, it also involves a special application for the program and the deadline has already passed. So I won't go uh, into detail into that program to, uh, today. So let's now zoom in on the one year program and let's start with corporate communication. So what is corporate communication? It focuses on uh, communication as a strategic instrument uh, which is targeted both at external stakeholders and internal stakeholders uh, of companies to organize uh, and achieve organizational objectives. Well, what does it mean? That means that communication is used as a way to organize information uh, of the, of the uh, corporation, both inside and outside the uh, company. Um, each track uh, has two specialization seminars. And specialization seminars are like the, 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 the core courses that are uh, uh, obliged for everyone, so uh, obligatory for every student. And the two core courses of corporate communication are strategic communication of organizations and strategic communication in organizations. Well, what do these courses entail? Well, strategic communication of uh, of organizations focuses on how organizations can communicate with their external stakeholders. So for instance, think about um, the labor market, um, uh, other, uh, uh, other corporations, news agencies, uh, politics, and so on. So uh, this is, m merely t this is uh, mostly talking about st strategies that cor corporations can use to external stakeholders. Um, we also have strategic communication in organizations. And this is about how the uh, corporation can communicate to its internal stakeholders, which are the employees. So what type of strategies should a company use in order to communicate with its employees to ob obtain these organizational objectives? Um, next to the ob uh, obliged courses, there are also electives. So each specific master track of the one-year program offers its own electives. From these electives, you can choose two. But you're also allowed to choose an elective from a different track. So for instance, if you want to choose uh, corporate communication as your main track, you are also allowed to choose an elective from a different uh, track, for instance, entertainment communication. Uh, so the electives that corporate communication itself has to offer are the following. Uh, corporate communication and hypermodernity, organizations on the web, corporate social responsibility communication, organizational behavior and communication, management of change, the economic crisis in the media, uh, PR, public relations, communication technology at work, and there is also an elective that is taught together with the persuasive communication track, and this is brands and organizations in social media. So all in all, a very interesting program. It's a, a brief outline that I'm giving you now, and you can look up further information online. Um, but now let's go to the second track that we have in the one-year program, which is persuasive communication. Persuasive communication focuses on communication processes aimed at reaching specific goals in health and marketing communication. So it is aimed at um, uh, studying uh, a whole variety of marketing and health communication uh, theories. And um, the interesting thing is that it also um, uh, teaches you how you can apply these theories to practical problems in the world, the world out there. So for instance, problems in health behavior or uh, advertising and branding. So the main goal that communication uh, serves here is to persuade people, to convince people they should change their behavior or maybe their attitudes and opinions uh, regarding a health behavior or an, uh, a brand, for instance. 
The two core uh, seminars, the specialization seminars, are called Marketing Communication and Health Communication. And like I said, both use similar theories, but uh, they both zoom, in, both zoom in on their uh, own specific uh, field. And uh, they teach you how you can apply these theories in practice. So for instance, in marketing communication, you, you learn how you can uh, uh, introduce a new brand into the market. And for health communication, you learn how to write a specific, uh, or how to develop a specific intervention plan to um, tackle a, s a specific health behavior. So for instance, people who start uh, using condoms when having sex. So again, electives that you can choose from. Uh, brand communication is an elective. Brands and organizations in so social media, like I already said, together with corporate communication. We have entertainment education and e-health. We have media strategies and persuasion and resistance. So how can uh, receivers, consumers or uh, people out there guard themselves against uh, persuasion attempts? So again, an interesting track. Uh, but you might also be interested, more interested in our, our third track, our political communication track. This track uh, focuses on the interaction between um, politics, uh, media and journalism, and the public opinion. So you sort of have a triangle of, uh, of actors, and this seminar is at the, uh, or sorry, this track is at the core of our democracy, uh, you could say. So the main goal that communication serves here is to inform people. And uh, the specialization seminars of this track are citizens and the public opinion. And this seminar deals with how uh, political communication, what the, uh, uh, influences the public opinion. So how does it affect people? And interesting questions are, for instance, uh, who gets, um, um, gets affected and who doesn't who who does not get affected by the message um, another elective that we have uh, sorry another specialization seminar that we have is journalism and the media and this deals with the interesting question of what journalism really is so what is freedom of speech uh, um, what does it mean to make good journalism and it talks about a specific uh, um, uh, journalistic outputs. It analyzes these together and there are uh, very active discussions uh, regarding what good journalism is and what role the mass media actually plays in, in this. Also, political communication offers its own electives. So an, uh, an interesting elective is political marketing. Marketing has, beco has become to play a bigger role uh, uh, over the years in uh, politics. So what does it mean for politicians to, uh, to use this marketing in their election campaigns? And what does it mean to, uh, um, uh, for the voters to be exposed to so much political marketing? So these are interesting questions that are answered here. Then uh, another seminar that is you, uh, that, uh, an, another elective that is offered in political communication is social media and politics. So how can poli politicians use social media in order to uh, attract voters for their campaign? And uh, the psychology in psychology uh, in political communication. This deals with um, the effects that political communication can have on uh, on the on the public opinion, but then um, also investigates the role that psychology, psychological factors such as personality characteristics or the emotions that people experience with certain issues can play when people are being exposed to uh, political communication efforts. Our final uh, uh, track is called entertainment communication. The focus here is on the media preferences that people have, and there is a, a huge emphasis on media psychology in this track. Um, and central in this master are the effects that new media especially have on people, but also how media exactly is used uh, to sort of, um, um, well, satisfy uh, the entertainment need that people feel. So what is the entertaining function that media can, can serve? Uh, so the, go uh, the role of communication in this master is uh, to entertain people. The specialization seminars that are offered here 
are uh, developing media entertainment and this specifically focuses on how you can how developers in the field out there can uh, develop the most effective uh, media uh, to uh, match the needs that the public has so uh, um, the nice thing about this specific uh, seminar is that students get uh, coupled with a specific company in the field and they write an advisory plan for their uh, for this company how they can um, change their their uh, media product so that it matches the uh, needs of the target group best the other specialization seminar that is offered is clashing view on media effects and this is an interesting discussion seminar in which um, uh, several views on media uh, that that are maybe at first sight not seem not so um, uh, not so similar and how they can be combined maybe so uh, uh, an interesting view that people have is for instance that the uh, media generation today is very narcissistic is only focused on themselves taking selfies displaying themselves on social media so it's a very negative view of the new media generation but there is also a positive side of the story and that uh, portrays this generation as a very um, Einstein generation that is very involved with um, um, uh, yeah, um, coming up with uh, creative solutions using innovative technology to uh, tackle problems that are out there. So these are clashing and how can you combine them? That's what you learn also in this interesting discussion seminar. Then there are some electives offered by the entertainment communication track. And the first elective is called the blind spot and this one um, uh, investigates several techniques that uh, also people out there can use to track the media use of young users. And this is very popular nowadays, so um, specific um, techniques that are talked about are for instance eye tracking, but also diary studies and other techniques are discussed in this elective. Then the, uh, the, another elective that is offered is called Interactive Entertainment Research and Design. So it's also an interesting elective. Uh, and the last elective that is offered is Success Factors in Media Products for Young People. And this focuses on uh, how is it possible that some media products are more successful than others. What type of factors do, do a me does a media product uh, has, have to have in order to be successful? So... A lot of information, um, and these are the, so the, the the four tracks of the one year master. And for all of these four tracks, the uh, schedule uh, of the master year is the same. So as you can see, the year is divided up in two semesters, um, and each semester comprises uh, three blocks: two blocks of eight weeks and one block of four weeks. Well, you start your master. Uh, Oh, obviously in the first semester with the first block and then you start your special your, your two specialization seminars so the core seminars of your track uh, plus you already start writing your thesis a bit you start thinking about an interesting uh, question for your final master thesis this is not only in the first block but also in the second block so 16 weeks in total then you follow up with four weeks research methods well these research methods, it's, it's, it is a research course, but it's actually uh, very handy and lots of students really like it because it's tailored to your specific question in your thesis. So it's very handy because the idea is that you learn more about the method that you will also start using uh, for your eventual master thesis. In the second semester, you uh, start eight weeks with two electives. So these are the elective, electives that you can choose either from your own track or from the different tracks. Um, these electives last for six weeks and together you also uh, uh, write, uh, uh, well, you write your thesis individually, but at the same time as the electives. Uh, this thesis phase, you, you work out your proposal better. And then in block two and block three of the second semester, this block, these two blocks are entirely devoted to writing your master thesis. So, um, and then at the end, um, hopefully, well, normally, you will end up with a very nice degree in communication science. So this was a regular one-year program. 
But like I said, you might be up for a bigger challenge and you really, you might really like to investigate theories, to make your own theory, to uh, do more of your own research, to really dive in into, uh, well, a bit more of academic literature. And um, this is what you can do in our two year program or research master program. And the nice thing about this program is that it combines these theoretical courses with a thorough training in conducting research. So there is also a huge methodological aspect in this course. And the interesting thing is also that you can make your own program from all the specialization seminars of all the four tracks I just mentioned. And you can also choose the electives from all the four tracks. So it's really tailored to your own specific needs. Plus you get a, a big, uh, you get a thorough training in research. So you then organize information, you inform, persuade and entertain your audience. The curriculum of the research master is a bit different. Um, it's two years, so you have a 120 ECs to, uh, to complete. And first of all, you have uh, 60 EC, uh, ECs of method courses. Um, of which 36 are obligatory in the sense that everyone takes the same and then you can choose the, for the uh, remaining ECs the other electives uh, of method courses, I mean. Um, then you have um, 30 EC of theoretical courses that you can choose from the entire program of electives and um, specialization seminars. Then you have six ECs of participation in, Am in the Amsterdam School of Communication Research Department. So there are lots of researchers working at OSCOR and you can choose the researcher that's doing the research that you like the best. You can um, uh, uh, join this researcher in a new project. You can maybe come up with your own proposal or you can help this researcher out with a specific project he or she is already working on. And this allows you uh, to really get a taste of what it feels like to um, to join the academic uh, uh, environment. And then finally, you end with your master thesis. Um, so I think this uh, was, um, well, a brief, uh, well, uh, some brief information about the programs that we offer. And I would like to see if there are maybe some questions about the program. So we can give you some time to maybe ask a question on the chat. Let's see if someone maybe has something. It seems like it's quite quiet. I think our team has already answered most of the questions yeah. that were out there, so that's very good, I think. Okay. Oh, there is a question I see about the two-year program from Motasem Kaliji. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. <laughs> it's a beautiful name. Okay, a question about the two-year research master program. Let's wait for that. The question is, is would there be any training in research methodology uh, in the one year? Pro oh, sorry, there's this is a different question. Okay, I'm going back to the correct question. What kind of research me methods training do students go through? Uh, that's a good question. There are, uh, I think, many courses. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about... Uh yeah, it's, it, it, it depends. If you already have enough knowledge uh, in research methodology, then you can uh, will be admitted to the program di directly. So you will have um, uh, the, the, the 60 required courses in the uh, research master program. But if you haven't got the right knowledge, then you have to do the preparatory program first. And there's a maximum of 18 credits that uh, will, will, will help you out to get the right knowledge in research methodology. So I think that's basically uh, what we have uh, for preparation into the research master. Um, but I will tell you something more about it later on when we discuss uh, the admission and uh, entry requirements of our program. Yes, uh, and I also saw a different question coming in here. Um, what the, the, there was a question about what kind of research methods training do students go through for also the one-year program? Is there research methodology? Uh, yes, there is for the one-year program yeah. as well. There's also maybe something you have to do uh, um, if you do not have the correct rec requirements, but that Nung will, uh, will tell us about it a bit more. But if you take the regular one-year program, you have the research um, methods course that is tailored to your thesis, which means depending on your research question, you either take a course in experiments, in survey, in qualitative research, or 
um, I'm forgetting one experiment. Yeah, experiment I think I okay. mentioned. Um, um, Content analysis. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's right. So, um, but that depends what the, the one you take depends on uh, your specific research question. So there is one uh, methodology course, a brief one of uh, four weeks. Yeah. Yes. And I see another question from Kalin Puello. Uh, should we have a research topic at the moment we start the application? Uh, well, it is not always necessary that you have already uh, done a research topic during your bachelor's, but it will help you out. Um, it is important that your bachelor degree has some interfaces with communication science, so you have uh, the right theories and the right mindset. Uh, in case you don't have uh, done a research topic, there is an uh, opportunity or there is a possibility that you will have to do the preparatory program first and then uh, you will have to do all the research courses in this program to prepare yourself uh, for the master's program. But again, um, depending on your degree and uh, what courses that you, uh, what courses you have followed, um, it will decide if you are um, eligible for the master program, and um, if you have the right background to to start with the preparatory program. Because if there is not any connection with communication science or social sciences, um, yeah, it might be difficult to. Uh, to meet up the, the yeah the backlog that yeah. you have so yeah i also have uh i saw one question of maria milovidova and she asked of the she asked uh, if the list of electives in corporate communication presents a list of topics or disciplines covered during the course um so yeah the electives they sort of give you a, a they go a bit deeper into specific topics, but mostly the topics that are mentioned in the electives, this holds for all programs, already get um, get covered a bit in the specialization seminar, so in the obligatory course. So the the, the, the electives gives you uh, give you a bit of an idea what also the content is of the um, uh, the obligatory specialization seminars. Yes. Okay. I think. Yeah, there are some. Uh, other questions that our team is already taking up, I think. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I, guess I see an interesting question also here from San Griffith. Can students from the other specializations work with external companies in the same way the entertainment specialization students can? Uh, yes, it's a good question. So I know also um, in uh, persuasive communication, there's also uh, some opportunities to work with external companies. and I can imagine that this is also uh, the case for um, corporate communication. Yeah, I think so. it's very uh, recommend uh, 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 recommended there as well. Um, but I know that some courses organize it themselves in the sense that they already link you to something to, to, to a, a specific company. But it's always appreciated if you want to go out in the field and you want to uh, come up with your own uh, cooperation with a, uh, with a practical partner. But then, of course, you also need to take care of this yourself, maybe a bit. Uh, but it is, um, and it is also in the whole master, it's very uh, uh, much stressed that always a link to the practical field is made by means of guest speakers or practical workshops or uh, other methods. So, uh, yes, this is not only in the entertainment uh, uh, communication no. track. Yes. Okay. I think the team is taking up most of... Uh, yeah, I, I, I see a question, maybe one last question uh, for Motasim Kalaji again, I think. Uh, a question about health communication, the, the master, well, the master track uh, persuasive communication okay. and the health communication part in that. Could you please, uh, I'm asked to, to give an example about the research that the university uh, conducts in persuasion communication and in the health communication track. So yes, there is lots of research going on at persuasive communication um, regarding health. Um, there is uh, research going on on specific um, uh, intervention campaigns. So for instance, should we uh, use uh, social norms in order to persuade people to change their behavior? Should we focus on uh, specific types of emotions, for instance? But also doctor-patient communication. So how can we improve um, uh, the, uh, the adherence of patients to their medical regi uh, regime. Uh, 
um, but also um, um, specific target groups. How can we convince them to change their behavior? So, for instance, um, uh, Turkish and Moroccan, Moroccan immigrants in uh, the Netherlands, they are a totally different target group from each other, but also from maybe from uh, um, um, some other groups in the Netherlands. So, um, how should you target these people uh, with a message? Um, so, there are, if you are interested in looking uh, in, at the research part, then maybe you could go to the website of uh, persuasive communication itself, which is called perscom, P-E-R-S-C-O-M dot com. Okay. All right. Yeah. I want to mention that um, all the websites with the practical information and information about the program will also be sent f uh, to you after the presentation. So uh, you will get uh, some kind of sheet with uh, all the links on it and you will be able to look everything uh, up and uh, go through it on your own uh, pace. Yeah. So uh, no need to worry about that. This is something that we will take care of. Okay. Yes. I think that's it. Yes, Thank I think you. this is it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to the second part uh, of uh, this presentation about application admission. We have invited one of our students here. Uh, that's uh, Robert. Hi, Robert. And uh, he's a student uh, from our um, uh, research master's program, and he is here today to tell you more about his experience as an international student in our program and what he his experience with our admissions and what he has done for it. Um, maybe uh, you can introduce yourself a bit. Sure. Hey guys. So my name is Rob, and I am from Canada. And uh, I've been here for two years now. I uh, am in the research master's program. And yeah, I'm excited to talk to you guys all about Amsterdam. Um, so if you have any questions regarding um, what it's kind of like to live here, some more of the practical kind of side of things, you know, like cycling, is it really a thing? And um, other things like that, um, feel free to shoot some questions to me and I'll be more than happy to answer them. So. Yeah. Okay, now That's this is Robert then. Uh, first I want to mention for all the Dutch viewers that this part of the presentation is um, more focused on international students. Uh, you are welcome to join, uh, but uh, some of the information is more relevant for international students than for uh, national students. Um, but please uh, continue watching this presentation if you want to. Okay, let's start then. Um, application and admission, um, yeah, we built this presentation up in three parts. Uh, we will first look at uh, the admission requirements for the master. Uh, then we are going to discuss what uh, the different uh, options are for your admissions. And then we also uh, say something about, okay, you have sent all your uh, uh, documents for, uh, for your application. What, ne what is next? So um, this is basically uh, the outline of what we are going to discuss today. And um, now we are going to talk about the admission requirements. Um, it is important to know that uh, according to the Dutch law, all students must have a, a academic bachelor degree before they can start them with their masters. This means that you must have completed your bachelor degree um, to be eligible for the master's program. Um, this is for Dutch students very easy. You, uh, every uh, Dutch student who has done their bachelor uh, at the university will be uh, eligible for the master's program. But for the international students, uh, it's a different story because uh, the bachelor level um, from uh, international students, in, 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 it's not the same not at the same level as a Dutch academic bachelor degree. Um, it can be confusing because you think, okay, I have complete a, completed a, a bachelor degree, so I'm eligible for the program. But unfortunately, the level is not the same. Um, that is why we are going to assess your acad academic background first. Um, we do this based on um, the information from the NOFIC. Um, this is an, uh, an institute that is uh, specialized in uh, the education system here in Holland, but also around the world. 
Um, so um, that is the first thing what we are going to do. But if everything is okay, you have the right level, then we are going to look at your application uh, more in the, uh, at the content. Um, and it is important to know that we will look at your uh, knowledge of communication science theories and your knowledge and skills on social research uh, methods and statistics. And why do we do this? Because uh, our program is uh, very uh, focused on research methodology. I know yeah, you are doing the research program, so you have a lot of research. But um, yeah, what is your experience exactly with research methodology? Uh, prior to doing my uh, to doing this program, I had no research, uh, any sort of experience, and so I did the prep program, and that was able to really kind of immerse me in research, how it is, you know, how it's conducted, and um, yeah, all of that fun stuff. Yeah, yeah, because besides you are going to conduct your research uh, with your thesis, um, all the classes, uh, the theories will have a, uh, a basis in the research. You will have to uh, be able to uh, understand those uh, articles, but also know what they have done exactly and if the research is, uh, is, is good, if you can use it. So uh, that is why we are, are going to look or the admission um, uh, board is going to look at your knowledge of research methodology. Um, furthermore, they will look at your motivation and, of course, your English level because all students must be able to read textbooks, uh, present, um, uh, write uh, English pa English paper. So that's it's quite important that your English is sufficient enough to start with our masters. Um, as you can see, this is are the things that we need from you to be able to evaluate your application. I will only go uh, further into certain topics like your English test, your empirical research paper and uh, the uh, course de descriptions. This is because we get a lot of questions from you guys uh, about how to uh, hand in these, uh, how to hand in these documents. Um, so let's start with the English test. Um, the English proficiency test is uh, obligatory for every student who isn't a native speaker. And with native speaker, I mean um, the America, United States of America, uh, Great Britain, uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia, and uh, the other Dutch students uh, don't have to do the English test also. Uh, for other students who have done their secondary school or the bachelor uh, program in English, uh, they can ask uh, if their English test can be waived. They can do this by sending uh, their um, uh, proof if they can demonstrate that they have done their entire bachelor degree in English or secondary uh, school and they have to point it out in their motivation letter that they have done this and that they want to be waived for the English test. Other side than that, uh, you ha will have to take an English test and this test uh, cannot be older than two years. Um, written work, um, yeah. I know um, uh, that you probably have read on the website already that you have to present some written work. We ask for written work because uh, we need to see um, how you apply uh, research methodology. That is why we also ask for a research paper. And uh, if you have written a quantitative research paper, we, prov we, we would like to see this uh, because uh, our program, the emphasis is on quantitative uh, research methodology. Uh, in case, because I can imagine, in case you haven't written a quantitative research paper, uh, you can also hand in a, a different research paper, like your thesis. Um, we also we will also look at your uh, English level and how you write uh, a paper. So uh, just present us a different uh, written work and uh, that will uh, will be will be fine actually oh yeah that's also important that all the papers must be written in english um, or else the admission board will not be able to read it 
that they cannot read Chinese or Russian, so it must be in English. And the most important part to translate then is your summary section, uh, the message section, and the results section. Um, course description. Um, this is also an important part. We ask from all students, all applicants, to send in uh, course descriptions. Um, the course descriptions of your uh, communication science related courses and your research methodology courses um, so that we can see uh, if you have got the right knowledge to start with the masters. Um, the research methodology co uh, courses, of course, uh, must have uh, descriptions, must have um, the literature, the, uh, the, 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 the analysis, analysis and um, uh, research methods that you have learned, and also uh, the, the, the goals, the, how do you say that? The objectives of the course must be in it. Um, again, this you can f find it also on the website a more uh, uh, more um, yeah uh, yeah you can f find more information about what exactly should be in the course descriptions uh, but uh, please make sure that you send it along because without it uh, we will not be able to assess your uh, or evaluate your application. Um, okay, then you have sent in your uh, application. It has been evaluated by the admission board and uh, you may start with our master program, but under which condition? Um, we, there are actually three options. Uh, the first option is that you are admitted to the program directly. This means that uh, your knowledge on research methodology and communication science is uh, good and uh, at the same level as our own bachelor students. So then you can directly start with our uh, master's program. But most of the international students will have to do the preparatory program first. Um, and the preparatory program consists of maximum 30 credits in total um, and uh, a minimum of six credits. Um, 18 credits are on uh, research methodology courses and 12 credits are on communication science theories. Um, depending on uh, the bachelor that you have done and the taken courses, uh, the admission boards will decide how many of those credits you will have to do during the preparatory program. Uh, a small group of you, really a small group, will be able, uh, they have a small uh, deficiency uh, in, in communication science or research methodology. They will be able to do the crash course in the summer or in January uh, if you start in February. But uh, yeah, most of you guys probably have to do the preparatory program first. Um, and in worst case scenario, if uh, your degree is totally different from communication science and it has nothing to do uh, with, with uh, yeah, social sciences, uh, yeah, there is a chance that you will be rejected. But um, yeah, the admission boards will always look first if you, uh, if you can uh, get the information or get the knowledge during the preparatory program. So they will evaluate every application individually and see if you, uh, yeah, you you can start with of the pre or the preparatory program or the master's program. Um, okay. As I said before, that probably most of you guys will start with a preparatory program. This is how the preparatory program looks like. It's one semester. Uh, each semester, uh, like Stephanie has told before, uh, consists of three blocks. Um, in the first two uh, blocks, you will uh, there is introduction to communication science and uh, introduction to research methodology. And in the last block, you will have research practice seminar. Uh, the I see that Anna has a question. Okay. Okay. This is a question. My uh, bachelor does not involve quantitative research. What now? Yeah, there's a possibility. Uh, is it a bachelor thesis or your bachelor degree? Bachelor 
program. Okay, yeah, it, it, it is not a problem if you don't have a uh, quantitative uh, research uh, courses during your bachelor program. Uh, then it is important that uh, you can demonstrate the admissions board that you have uh, completed uh, courses that are related to the social science field. So uh, that you can uh, demonstrate that your affiliation with communication science, um, because we can uh, you you can work on your uh, quantitative research uh, method methodology during the preparatory program as Robert has done because mm -hmm. he is doing now the research. Uh, uh, master's program, but has done the the full preparatory program first, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah that's so that's 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 something that's also possible. Okay. Um, let me see. Where was I? Um, oh yeah, with the preparatory program. Uh, well, this is how it looks like. It starts uh, twice a year, in September and in February. Um, so uh, you have two. Two, two moments in a year to enter the preparatory program. Um, yeah, that's basically it. And we also have, like I said before, the crash courses. Uh, only uh, a small students or small uh, part of you will take the crash course uh, because uh, most of you guys have too much, uh, your deficiency is too much to uh, be bridged by the crash course. So you yeah, have to do the preparatory program first. Um, but if you are, uh, if you can do the crash course first, it is uh, a course that is, uh, will take two weeks. And during the week, those weeks, you will uh, try to get the knowledge that a normal student will get in like eight weeks so you can expect that it can be quite intense and that you already have have to have a lot of knowledge already from the course and that only a small part will uh, that you only have to learn still a small part of it okay um yeah if you send your application to us, uh, it probably will take about eight weeks before you will get a decision. So don't panic if you haven't heard from us within six weeks or four, because there are so many steps uh, during uh, uh, evaluating your application that it can take a while before we can uh, send you an answer. Uh, so six weeks don't need to worry if it's it's longer than eight weeks you can always email us and we will see uh, what has happened to your application or why there's a delay we will be happy to answer you that um, and afterward you will receive a final decision from us okay I think this is the part about the uh, application and admissions I don't know if you guys have any questions I'm looking Eric and Anna, they are, have totally under control. Okay, uh, Belinda Nodder uh, has a question. Um, she asks, is it possible to hand in the English test after the application deadline? Yes, it's possible. Uh, you can hand it in later. Uh, important to know is that uh, you will need a sufficient test score to be able to start with the program. Um, so you will be taking some risk there if you get accepted to the program. You must, you will get accepted under the condition that you complete an English test uh, before you start with the program. Um, therefore, I recommend students that they uh, plan their test before the application deadline. And if it's not possible, with maximum, I think, one or two months uh, after application deadline, so you can be you are certain that you uh, will pass the test, and if you haven't, you have still the opportunity to retake the test because um, it's 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 we are quite strict on it that if you don't f uh, meet this requirement, you cannot enter the program. I don't know. I think. Let me see. Okay, Motassem Kalichi has another question. 
Uh, he says, uh, my bachelor degree was done in an American university and was completed, completely done in English. What proof do you need for the application? Well, in that case, if you have uh, done your, um, your entire bachelor in America and it's completely taught in English, um, just a certified copy of your bachelor degree uh, will be fine. So uh, that will have enough proof that your uh, you have done your, your your bachelor degree entirely in English. Um, oh, and it looks like there's a question for myself from uh, Aswarya. Uh, um, so my the question is, what was my bachelor's in? And my bachelor's was in business. So um, there was some sort of there were communication aspects and marketing classes that I was able to take. But however, because there were no real research related courses, I, that's why I had to take the, uh, the research prep course and then the research mass or the uh, research practicum. So, yeah. Okay, um, we are going to wait a bit because my colleague is writing a question down. I'm very mm. curious what the question is, <laughs> mm. if it's important. Ah, am I eligible, eligible for the program? Yeah, that's a question that we get a lot via the emails. Um, the, the thing is, what I always say is, uh, it depends on your uh, your your bachelor degree and your taking courses. Uh, we look at your. Uh, communication science theories li related uh, courses and research methodology, what I said before, and based on every individual applicant, the admissions board will decide if a person or a student is uh, will be accepted. So the only thing what I can say right now is just hand in a complete uh, application to see if you are eligible for the program because, uh, yeah, what I said, we first we have to assess your academic background to see if you have the right level, and then we will uh, look at the courses that you have taken to see if it's relevant or that the, that the studies will have a connection with ours. So I'm sorry I cannot uh, give you uh, 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 one answer to this, but uh, you will have to uh, apply first to be to know if you are eligible for the program. So we have another question. Um, again, does a three-year work experience in communications and marketing count? Um, actually, refer, well, uh, the, the, your, your bachelor degree is the most important part uh, of uh, the evaluation. If you don't have the right level, you are not eligible for the program. So um, if you have done something else, but you can show them that you have done a lot of things in, in the communication field, then it, 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 it can matter. But if your level isn't uh, at the same level as our academic uh, bachelor degree, then it has no use. So uh, yeah, it, 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 it might help you out, but the most important thing is your bachelor degree because that uh, is something that is, yeah, yeah, it's one of the entry requirements. Um, let me see. Belinda Norte has another question. Is there a limitation of numbers of international students um, that can do uh, communication science? Uh, no, there is not a, a limit. Uh, all uh, application, uh, everybody can apply, and we still are able to. Uh, if if you are accepted, we are still able to give you a spot. Uh, of course, we don't know how it will uh, follow. It will be in the near future. If it's if we are going to expand uh, a lot, then uh, there will be a limitation. But for now, it's okay. We have uh, like I think. Uh, 213 students this semester starting and that's quite actually quite good and we are still able to provide them um, a place a spot in our program um, yeah I think that one I 
have just answered. Um, I think that's all it. I think the all the questions my colleagues are able to answer via chat. So we can move on to the next topic about uh, the practical side if you are getting here and if you have been accepted. And Robert is going to tell you a lot of his experience about this. Uh, first of all, housing. Uh, mm -hmm. The UFA provides uh, housing. Uh, you can apply for it because uh, finding a room here in Amsterdam can be quite dramatic and expensive. So to uh, help you out, because you are probably going to stay here for a year or one and a half year, uh, we provide uh, housing via the UFA so you can apply and then uh, it is almost certain that you can uh, book a room. Uh, but Robert is going to tell you more about this and his experience. Yeah, so like uh, New had mentioned, uh, it's really great that the UVA provides uh, housing for um, a lot of international students. And for this, uh, when I applied for my housing, um, what students will see uh, is a system that you apply through called Embark. And through the Embark system, this is where you uh, pay your student or your housing fees and are able to uh, select your room. And just a few notes about that stuff. So the rooms, uh, it's first come, first serve. So when you are accepted to the University of Amsterdam and you get, uh, you're accepted through housing, um, you know, pay attention to when you have to select your room. Um, next up for the Embark housing fees, uh, make note that it is payment is required uh, specifically by credit card, and I actually didn't have a credit card at that time. And so what I was able to do to um, go around it was to just get a prepaid visa, and that's how I was able to pay for my housing fees. Um, and please also to keep a note that uh, the housing is uh, only available for everyone for one year. So I was uh, in the research masters. I did the prep course. So um, my time here in Amsterdam, Amsterdam is nearing about two and a half years. So if you're in the prep program um, or if you're interested in doing the research masters, please be advised and note that uh, you're going to have to look for housing. Um, it's not as scary and daunting as it seems. Um, you know, space in Amsterdam is a bit tight, but there are lots of opportunities to look through different websites, through Facebook, um, but just keep that in mind because you need to start looking for rooms, you know, about two to three months before before you leave. Um, also, uh, so the housing itself is comprised of three different uh, types of housing. Um, there, you, the first is a, a shared room with shared facilities, and this typically looks like. Um, I had some friends who stayed in one of these houses, one of these apartments, and it typically looks like um, uh, a large room uh, with very tall ceilings, and somebody is living on the somebody has a bed on the second half of the floor, and the other student has a bed on the first, uh, the bottom part of the floor, and then you 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 share the the facilities and a kitchen with some other dorm mates. Um, the the room type that I had was the the private room with shared facilities. So I had my own private room that was lockable, and then I shared the bathroom and the kitchen with one other person. And if you really value you value your privacy, you can always get the uh, private room with private facilities. And please note that you know the, the cost does differ regarding uh, these room types. So uh, going on to this. Uh, for the housing costs, you know, you will see that the uh, application for or the housing application costs around 500 euros. There also is a, a housing um, fee that you do have to pay for administration costs, and then da a damage deposit and rent is uh, around 1,900 to uh, 300, yeah, uh, 3,000 uh, per semester. But also make note that um, you know when you first arrive in Amsterdam, a lot of the housing fee sort of stuff is all due right when you get there. So you have to pay your damage deposit, the first month's rent, and uh, and your housing fee. So it can look like a lot in one month, but um, you'll survive. Don't worry. It's all good. It's all good. Um, yeah. So with that, we'll we'll continue to move on. And if you have 
any questions about housing, um, you know, more detailed questions about it, or even just uh, the living situation type of stuff, just, yeah, send us some questions. And we'll give you a moment to think. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, he yeah. will be staying afterwards uh, also with uh, the 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 Q and A. So if you still have a question, then you will be able to ask them. And yeah, you mm -hmm. are here to uh, to answer them, right? Yeah. Well, it looks like we have a few oh. questions right now, actually. Okay. So uh, from uh, Divya, sorry, and I I apologize uh, Ed, if I pronounce your name wrong, but Divya asks. Uh, so how far is housing from the university? This is the brilliant thing. Housing from the university is so close. Literally, um, there's one complex that you walk over a bridge and you're right at campus. Like it's, you know, a two to three minute walk. It's perfect, especially if you have some early morning classes. Um, there's other there's other spots around the city. Um, they typically range from, you know, a 10, 15, sometimes even 20 minute bike ride. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's all super central, which is great, especially because, um, you know, for um, for the Dutch students, they don't necessarily get this, so it's really it's quite it's, it's quite an advantage to be an international, I guess. <laughs> um, and so we have a, a next question from um, Mots Motsem, um, and they ask, "How much is rent approximately outside university housing?" Ooh. So this is kind of yeah. So. Uh, it's it's a bit more. Yeah, it's a bit more, I think, and it it it, it differs really a lot because uh, I think the if you are lucky, you can find a house within five hundred euro each month. Uh, but sometimes I have seen prices around six hundred, seven hundred mm -hmm. euros. So um, yeah, there's a quite a large range on it. Uh, but some lucky students will be able to find a house or a room um, for less than 500 euros a month. And I think you will, yeah, it, it will be like 12 foot square, I think, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah it usually ranges. Like, uh, when it comes to uh, the housing provided by the UVA, it's, you know, usually around you know 450 550 per month and if you're looking for the same location for the same approximate size within city of Amsterdam privately you're thinking about playing um, you know maybe um, like mm. almost two times or a, a bit less than two times that amount so it can be pretty pricey yeah. it can be pretty pricey um, so Belinda oh oh so we've Got it covered. Belinda, Belinda was asking um, about any websites to find furnished rooms or apartments. Uh, I found a furnished room through Facebook, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, housing groups available through Facebook. And if not, there is um, other websites that uh, I believe you're able to find on the university website. Yeah. Okay. I think. I think that's. Yeah. Oh. Okay, I heard that we are running out of time, so we are going to get through this really quickly about the visa. Um, yeah, some of you guys will need a visa or a resident permit to uh, be able to study here. Um, it depends on the, your nationality. Uh, if you got two nationalities, then it's um, we recommend to choose the one uh, that is uh, within the European Union because your tuition fee will be uh, less than someone outside the European Union. Um, yeah, we have an overview here on what you can expect when you have uh, when you need a resident permit and a visa or only a resident permit. Um, more information about this can be found on our website at the UFA or uh, at the government. Um, yeah, and um, if you have to apply for visa, you, we uh, will uh, send you an email where you can fill out uh, your information of your details, but also you will have to upload some documents. Mm -hmm. Robert has done that because he's from Canada. He, he needed a resident permit and um, he can tell you something more about it yeah so when preparing these documents um, you know you you see the the list provided um, go sh go through and make sure that a, a lot of these documents are updated
updated, um, you know, that your passport is valid uh, throughout the, the duration that you'll be in Holland for, um, also with your antecedent certificates. Um, for your proof, proof of insurance, uh, this is pertaining to health insurance and so there are, I know that the, the university does recommend certain sites. Um, I used Aon Student so I just searched AON uh, Student Insurance and was able to choose the date ranges that I'd be here for to get health insurance for it. And then financial proof, if, you're, uh, if you take out a line of credit the university will ask you to put the full amount um, that is required into your checkings or savings account and then do a screenshot of uh, your bank statement as proof and then you can then you can put the the funds back into your line of credit so you don't rack up that insurance and lastly for Chinese students uh, please make sure that you have your NUFIC certificates in order and if you have any more questions yeah, yeah. I think it's better if we uh, answer the question after the presentation because we are running out of time so we are m going to move along to the okay. next slide um, cost and living expenses uh, yeah, the tuition fee uh, depends on your nationality. Um, I would uh, refer you to the student service desk or to our website because um, you can fill out there your nationality and uh, other specific things and they will calculate uh, exactly what your tuition fee will be. Um, and besides that, there is also some living expenses that you have to take into consideration. Um, Robert here as a student knows exactly what he's spending per month, I think. So he's going to tell you something more about what he will he is, 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 is giving out uh, on, on, on coffee and drinks, things like <laughs> that. So as you can see here, uh, accommodation when you're uh, plan to plan to spend around four to f uh, four to six hundred euros per month. Um, you know you'll you'll have to pay for the visa for insurance, um, and then when it comes to general living expenses, uh, I uh, tend to have budgeted um, when you first get to Amsterdam, perhaps around a hundred euros uh, every two weeks, so maybe fifty euros. Uh, every every week so for groceries drinks coffee um, especially because you know when you're when you first come to the city there's a lot to do there's a lot of other expenses that you don't really consider like you know buying your first bike if your bike gets stolen buying another bike um, you know getting museums cards so you can access all of the museums um, so it's when you're budgeting budget for for some cushion funds um, that way you know if you have a lot of leftover savings you can spend it on more coffees or more beers um, and when you're, if you're thinking about taking public transport, um, I also uh, would recommend to think actually about cycling because all of your public transport expenses will be cut um, if you cycle, which is a very Dutch thing to do. So, yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. So, yes, uh, scholarships. I think that some of you guys find this very interesting. Um, we, as the UVA, provide three different scholarships, the Amsterdam Excellence Scholarship, the Amsterdam Merit Scholarship, and the Holland Scholarship. Um, we, in, we, we won't, uh, we, we, we uh, uh, try to find the, the, uh, the students who excel in their uh, previous education. We try to select those students who can demonstrate that they are the best in their program uh, for these scholarships. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, the competition can, can be quite hard. And um, since we don't have a lot of these scholarships to give, uh, but there are a lot of students who apply for a scholarship, the chances of being selected is very slim. So um, please note that uh, you will have to uh, excel in a certain matter to, uh, to be able to, uh, to get a scholarship. Um, the Amsterdam uh, Excellence Scholarship and the Amsterdam Merit Scholarship are pretty much the same uh, for the requirements. Um, also, uh, only the selection is a little bit different. Um, the Amsterdam Excellence Scholarship is something uh, that is, uh, the students are selected from the whole UFA, so 
there's quite a lot of students to pick from and the Amsterdam Merit Scholarship is just within our program. We can select one or two students, uh, but again, uh, we will uh, we will uh, select the one who has the best records and uh, ex have excelled in their uh, bachelor program. So uh, if you can prove that you belong to the 10% of your class, you will make a chance of being selected for uh, one of these two scholarships. Uh, also, uh, the Holland scholarship we, 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 uh, we offer. Um, this, uh, this is a new scholarship and um, uh, for this year we have decided to put it in the Amsterdam Merit Scholarship. Um, we don't know yet if we are going to do this for the upcoming year or if we are going to uh, offer it as a separate scholarship. But um, yeah, that, there you can also apply for the Holland Scholarship, but um, you can, uh, if you are going to apply for it, you can um, add it to the Amsterdam uh, Merit Scholarship. Uh, what you should know is that we only uh, select these students for the September semester. So if you are going to start in February, uh, you will not be able to apply for it. Only students who enter the master's program per September will be eligible for it. And also only students outside the European Union uh, can apply uh, for it. Okay. Yeah, because you have gotten a scholarship. What did you do to...? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I have, um, actually have the Amsterdam Merit Scholarship, and um, I, I applied for that. Um, but before going through, um, you know, I, I really recommend um, everyone who's watching right now to go on Grant Finder um, and to look at uh, scholarships through your government. Um, because a lot of governments, except for Canada, will provide scholarships for students to attend university outside of their country. Um, and one thing I really do strongly recommend is uh, after this, if you, um, I think, you know, if you are watching this, you should be thinking about uh, applying for scholarships just because it makes life a lot easier. And in doing so, uh, maybe just take, you know, an hour or so and just think about uh, why you would deserve a scholarship and just, you know, in an empty word page, just write down some of the merits that um, you believe you have and why you would be deserving of a scholarship. And then when you look, it's a lot easier because then, you know, you have a drafted statement um, that you can tailor to. So, yeah, good luck. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, I think that's it for now. Um, I'm really sorry that I had to rush the, 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 the last uh, sheets. Um, but now we have the time to uh, answer some questions. Um, I think it's, uh, we are open up uh, a poll afterwards and we will be sitting here for half an hour to uh, answer all the questions via the chat. Uh, for now, this presentation is actually uh, over. Let's get a quick scan to the uh, questions that are asked in the chat to see if something is really important to share. Um, I think not. Do you see anything? No, I think these questions mm -hmm. can be uh, answered via the chat. Um, so, thank you for joining us today and I hope that you received uh, all the answers to your questions and uh, hopefully we will see you in uh, February. Mm -hmm. Thanks guys.